like Marilyn Monroe who are capable of Im embodying, embodying, using her body to be present in the world for the other person's imagination so that her, move, her movements were, as it were, extensions of, of the wishes of others. And you, the evidence for that, you remember, was, was actually it's, it's a, it comes from several places, but one is the photographer who never needed to tell her how to pose. She knew better than they did the, what they wanted from her. Or as she said herself, she was a different person with everybody she was with. But you couldn't stay a different person very long with anybody. Who could, you know? Well, she certainly, uh, she's uh, honest for all the, the capacity to fake in the short run. She was honest in the long run. Honest in the long run, wasn't she? Because if you were married both to Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller, right? If you could make those people feel that they were soulmates with those two people, soulmates with, each, with you, what that says about your capacity to curl up inside someone's imagination of such different imagination. But she couldn't do it very long. Couldn't do it very long. And of course, the Heideggerian would say the call of her own being came somewhere. And so after a while, Joe would look up from the television set with his six pack and wonder where she'd gone. You know? I don't know what happened with Arthur Miller and the rest, but it probably was something, it might have been something similar. But that's a chilling example for us. That is a suspicion that we have to carry with us, with, particularly in our moments of triumph. Particularly in our moments of triumph, because those moments of triumph may be the clearest sign that someone has curled up inside our imagination. We had a patient across the way years ago. I still see her in Harvard Square now and then, eating buns at Opan. Oh, what's that place called? Opan. Oh, Anyway, that, that place in the square, and I see her, and she, she was miraculous. She would come and talk, and the workers who never were sure of anything they ever thought of, people who really didn't, were totally puzzled by everything, sensibly often puzzled by everything that happened, after a conversation with her would come out confident, spewing interpretations and diagnoses like a fountain, because she made them, she made them feel confident and good. And she'd say, and said, given them the things they wanted, reinforced, and, but she was even more rapid in her changes of heart. So they could be disappointed a day or so later, but for a while, it was a glorious experience. And we all know that. We buy that in our political leaders. And we need it, we need it in our relationships. And, and it isn't something to be made fun of. It's a, it's a glorious thing, as long as we don't uh, take it quite as seriously as, uh, as Joe took it, or Arthur Miller, or or some of us, others of us too. Now what I want to do here before I get to the, to the termination thing is to, is to um, just speak a little bit about these common factors, what I call common factors, and enlarge them a little bit. Because one of the reasons that I think the common factors problem um, is so central to our work is that we haven't it isn't yet accepted, at least in the literature that I encounter, it isn't accepted that the common factors are hard to apply. I mean, everybody thinks it's very hard to make the right interpretation or sort of set up the treatment. But the common factors are regarded like common people <laughs> or common sense. You know, it's like everybody had them. But in fact, common sense is the rarest of qualities in my experience. And, and the common factors may be the most, as I believe they probably, question mark, question mark, are the most important factors in determining the outcome of treatment. At the same time, treatment doesn't always turn out as well as it might, and I think it's because the common, one major culprit is that we haven't been able to apply the common factors. And so I want to talk about what makes it difficult to have a good relationship, to prize people, to understand them. And I've been doing that off and on. But what I've, what I've come to, I think, realize in the course of giving these talks and working them up is that all along I think I've been talking pretty much in that language and that when I've talked about the difficulties of comprehending other people's perspective I've really been talking about applying the common factor of understanding and when I talk about what you have to do to, to set up a some degree of mutuality or understanding with a paranoid person I'm talking about why it's hard to treat paranoid why it's hard to apply these so-called common factors 
So they're really uncommon factors like common sense. Now, <clears throat> most of this is, is again, you know, plain, perhaps not worth saying, but because it, but because it's, it is so common a problem, I want to, I want to highlight it. Why can't we respect each other? You know, why can't we sometimes even respect the people that pay us right? or come to us with a hope from us? Why can't we do that? Um, well, I, my, my main answer to this has been, you remember, that in the course of encountering another person's perspective, one goes along in a little honeymoon for a while, and then something happens which is either called error or sickness. That is, we begin to look at the other person's perspective as a mistake or as a sickness. And, um, and that's the moment, I think, when the respect begins to fall. The stock market falls for respect. Right? And, and that's a moment at which one has to then, I'm, say, I'm suggesting, and I'm re repeating something I said at length earlier, of course, that's, that's at the moment at which one needs to put the terms sickness or error in brackets and see it instead as a sign that our perspectives have collided and that I have to make an effort to see it more from the other person's point of view. Now, I don't mean that there aren't errors and that there isn't sickness. I don't mean that. I just mean that that's a hard thing to get to. And you've got to work a long time. And you may never get there, in fact. In fact, one of the curious paradoxes that absolutely fascinates me about this work is that in the course of trying to get to someone's perspective and avoid the impression of error and sickness, things change. The system changes. And you may have the very thing you want at the end because you never reached for it at the beginning. Now, this issue of genuineness, you know, which you remember that this very interesting uh, statement that is made about Carl Rogers' relationship to the problem of genuineness. Uh, the statement that's made, and I've heard it now on a number of occasions, and I'm, I, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's, there may be something to it, that he, he didn't have genuineness as a factor in his so-called client-centered therapy until he began to deal with schizophrenic people. Now, I, that, that to me is a, is a very interesting sort of natural event because if you've spent as much time with so-called schizophrenic people as I have in my in clinical career, you know that it is extremely hard to be genuine with them because they make you think they're crazy. So you immediately delegate them to a particularly inferior status where you can condescend, essentially, or patronize them very easily. On the other hand, if you can avoid that, if you can just sort of sit around with each other, and I remarked upon this extraordinary experience that we had over and over again in the old days, not now seem old, a few years ago, when we had the Met State as a place for our residents, and, and we, we tried to give them six months out there in which no one noticed what they were doing. <laughs> in which they sort of sort of sat around and, and, and sometimes they didn't come to work at all and I tried not to notice that and, and, uh, and they and, and but eventually something happened not invariably but you know most a good deal of the time that was in my opinion truly extraordinary um, the young doctors and the quote crazy patients at first the doc young doctors being you know frightened to death or, or appalled by this person I remember more than one uh, young person saying to me after a week or two in the place, you know, all my life I have been trying to keep away from this situation. <laughs> well, you know, right. I mean, who, 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 could, who could not agree with that? It sounds like extraordinary. The dirt, the horror, the neglect, the isolation, the strangeness. I mean, you want that? I mean, you know, you got enough of it without I would look for it. Um, anyway, there they were, stuck with each other. And what happened? Well, after a while, um, there wasn't much to do, you know, after you decided someone's crazy, and, and then you still come back and have lunch with them. It's, the, it changes, doesn't it? And, and, and then something happened, which to me was really surprising, because on, on maybe 20% of the time, 25% of the time, people would say, after six months, usually by the third or fourth month, that this patient 
was one of the best or the best friend they had ever had. Well, now that's that's not perhaps as remarkable as it seems at first blush. Because if you've been a, if you've been a pre med student. <laughs> And you've had to go to medical school, and you've had to study and take chemistry, which you might hate, especially if you're going into psychiatry. You've had to do that for innumerable years. Who has time for friendship? <laughs> so that uh, they've been through a long, the young people have been through a long desert of human experience. And then, but then to find that the desert ended at an oasis in the most improbable of places, you know, that was something. I think it was helped by the fact that many of the so-called crazy people were naked, that they did not, in fact, have the so-called defenses. And this is an old formulation of psychosis, which makes it harder to be friends with some people because they are defended. And so that if you can once get through the original horror and then abandon some of your own pretenses, you know, you, you're, you're ripe for this, this friendship. But maybe it was something like that which got Carl Rogers to think to add genuineness to his uh, his little list. What keeps us from it? Well, here I have suggested that the that the operative term is cliches or conventions. That our capacity to be spontaneous with each other, in some sense, to sort of let down our barriers, uh, not to not to be uh, professional or official and things of that kind with people. Um, that that uh, suggests an abandonment of kind of the expectations. I would call them cliches, but that's negative. Others would call them wise professional conventions. And there's no question that that, um, that they often are very wise professional conventions. Here again, you know, all the, this common factors advice gets a bad name. A word like genuineness gets a bad name because by itself, all by itself, it can go a long way, but it can't go far enough, and it can get in a lot of trouble. And I've remarked here from my experience with the young people is that they come in two sizes, you remember, those who are too genuine and those who weren't genuine enough, those who had to learn professional protection and those who had to abandon it a little bit. You know? And everybody had a lot to learn, and it was very different than what they had to learn. But some element of this capacity to peek out from behind your white coat um, that uh, that seemed to be a factor that is essential in, in certain circumstances. There are other times when we all know as clinicians that you get behind that white coat, you get by and stay there because uh, you you don't want to encourage certain things too much because they're going to come after you. you know? There's no no need to be human with this one. No need at all. Wait a while, wait a while. Set it up, take your time. But, uh, until you can be sure you can come out in a way that is, is operative and not overwhelmed. And then the understanding, the need to, to mingle perspectives. We know I've talked at length about the kinds of things that make that difficult, including the sense of error and... and, um, and um, and uh, sick, the concept of error and sickness, but but the I, I think the fundamental difficulty in 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 mutual understanding comes about because of the unwillingness to acknowledge our atomism. That is the fact that we do not see things the same way. And it's it's a lack of excited expectation of being surprised. You know that's what one wants in the game of understanding. What can you teach me? You know, what don't I know? You know, that's the attitude that favors the possibility of understanding uh, uh, more than simply an empathic. And 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 that's that's the corruption of, of an idea, which is natural in this in any circumstance. But this but this this willingness to acknowledge that you your perspective is, is in some respects radically different than mine and, and unreachable by mine. And um, that, I think, is, is uh, the foundation of, of, of understanding rather than the, an empathic uh, reaching. And then prizing, 
you know, from the beginning I said I thought one of the fundamental principles in our work is to expect health rather than sickness, that the person is well rather than sick. And that, that, and that, that follows logically, it follows logically from the, uh, the notion of, um, of um, different perspectives. It means that we just cannot, aff we, we are not in a position to make a statement about sickness despite the DSM-3 categories useful as they can be. Um, and the the prizing, how far should we carry it? I've commented on that already in terms of the dangers of of, uh, of uh, over entitling people, of exciting people too much. Um, that brings us very much to the to the, an issue which is. Which, I, which I keeps interrupting my thought as I go through these, which is that is the intuition I have that what we prize about people most has something to do with the psychologically real. Um, and and I, I, I don't think I could argue that in any convincing way at all. Um, but you remember this passage that I read you from, from Nietzsche, the one which ends in this extraordinary sentence. It is thus with us not only in music, it is precisely thus that we have learned to love everything that we love. We are always recompensed finally for our goodwill, our patience, our reasonableness and gentleness toward what is unfamiliar by the unfamiliar slowly throwing off its veil and presenting itself to us as a new ineffable beauty, he says. And then notice what he says. That is its thanks for our hospitality. But notice the irony in that. In other words, <laughs> that, that they've come across as being beautiful to thank us for accepting them. But the thanks that is represented by their seeming to us beautiful is in part a fraud. Right? And he, because he knows that they aren't really terribly beautiful. No more. You're no more beautiful than I am. You may be a good deal more beautiful than I am, but but, you, but it really isn't. It isn't astronomically different. But that because because this has been exercised, then the thing gains value in our mind. That in fact, the person is really quite familiar, quite like most other people, and yet the the response to the hospitality is this brightening, you might say, of the ordinary. Well, finally, I, I suggested that, that uh, persistence and, and transmitting, persistence and transmitting should be added to the list of these common factors. And I think that it hasn't been because most of the studies aren't done on long-term work. Very little, there's very little literature on, on the evaluation of long-term work that I know anyway. And, um, and that the, but the need of persistence, and here I, here I tried to make much of the concept of leaning into the, the repetition, leaning into the thing you didn't like, and allow, and, and here again the connection was with the real, because when you were with the person, there were things you couldn't be comfortable about. And they may, you may have thought there was sickness and, and, and error, but really it's a difference in our perspective maybe. And yet I got to do something about it. I can't twist myself into a pretzel because I want this relationship to work. And it won't work if I twist it into a pretzel. It'll be like a marriage where one person is doing everything for the other person. I have to find a way to somehow get a little bit of myself taken care of in this relationship. And that's what I meant by leaning. Psychotherapy may be about, you know, having a relationship that works. That's one conclusion you could draw from the common factors. So how do I make it work? Well, I make it work by respect and genuineness and all this. But I also make it work by leaning into things I don't like so that the person gets the idea. And that's a poor way to talk, isn't it, leaning? But I think it's central. And with that comes the problem of despair. You know, the patient doesn't believe this relationship or any other can work for them. And I have to both understand, that goes back to the earlier principle, understand the despair, and at the same time, 
lean into it with a kind of confidence that maybe it can be different. I've been here before, you know, I understand. I'm not telling you to be cheerful when you're not, when you're not, but I lean into it. And, um, and those of you who have had the privilege of knowing, you know, uh, many young people as I have been <coughs> richly blessed by many, so many wonderful young people know that, that there always comes a certain point when the two of us who are trying to make something happen, you know, the, whether it's the residents and the children or whatever, you know, the, the, the things, <laughs> they don't do it right. I don't think they do it right. I would like them to do it different, you know. Uh, well, how do you, it's, supervision's a good situation where this occurs, you know. I think I'd like to see you do things. Well, how do you, how do you really bring that to bear in a productive way? Not just create a formula or a cliche that the person takes over from you, because if you've watched this supervision as long as I have, you know, if you tell people how to do it, they'll take it and then they'll botch it. And it's perfectly natural because this is an organic process and you can't just p impose something on it. You have to lean a little bit into them so that they begin to think, not think differently, but sort of make gestures that are a little different. And, I, and, I, and I, all along I've been saying this, that, you know, and this is, our work is gestural, it's movement. Language is all very fine, it's intellectual, and it's very good at Harvard, but it isn't, doesn't have much to do with our work, I don't think. It, what, the language is what you do afterwards, like Freud's remark about the scientific purposes. But when you know, you know, when you wish, you wish the person would, um, oh well, take a little longer to make up their mind. Well, how do you, <laughs> how do you, con how do you, uh, you know, how do you signal that? If you say, oh, take longer to make up your mind, what good is that? I mean, how much longer? I mean, it just isn't right. I mean, should you wait two weeks, three weeks? Who knows? How you can't? It wouldn't. It's no good to you. You know, it's like it's like those signs you see next to mountains on the roads, falling rock zone. I mean, what are you supposed to do? I mean, look up so you get hit by the rock. I don't know. It, it's, it is the, the world is full of advices like that. And, and, and uh, so, I, but if you lean a little, I know what I do is I go around the corner of places like that. I lean a little. You know, I try to keep away from the mountain. You know, and uh, and that seems to be a more natural response to it. In the same way here, this persistence. Um, and then finally, I talked already enough about this transmission of of courage business. But those two things, the, the leaning and the, and the transmitting uh, entitlement, again, both relate to the common factors and, and bring us still closer to this idea of the, of the real. Well, that's all they are. also bring us closer to the idea of ending, not only ending these lectures, but also ending the treatment. And this question of termination. Do we terminate? Now let's imagine, and it happens sometimes too, doesn't it? We've all experienced it, that, that the patient has really, you know, gotten something they needed. They're able to, they're able to, to take care of themselves, for example, establish the kind of relationships that they deserve. You know, that they've really gotten there, right? It, when that happens, do we need to terminate? Isn't it more like the ripe fruit falling off a tree? I mean, I, I found that for the most part they somehow they don't just disappear, but it somehow attenuates. It just doesn't seem a very good reason to continue. And and, uh, and, and and then I hear my my colleagues say, "Well, you didn't terminate enough." And I said, "Well, it, it, it seemed to me that the thing had terminated by itself. You know, the way it, it sort of took care of that." And uh, um, and then I think, well, how do you say goodbye to children? Well, you know, they, they go to school. There are various transitions, aren't there? School, and they may go to boarding school, or they may go to college, or they may get married. I mean, you know, and you have sort of ceremonies for those things. You know? But but if if you feel that they're comfortable doing that, if you're not just extruding them, uh, then it doesn't seem to require a great deal of conversation. On the other hand, it sometimes I sometimes feel like we're urged to have those conversations, and maybe I'm too reticent, but when I was a resident at Mass Mental in the 50s, it, uh, everybody wanted to terminate. It, it, was, it was probably a function of Elvin Semrad, who's, who was very 
who thought that a great deal of psychological work could be phrased in terms of mourning, lost objects, facing sadness, bearing that. And it was it was a good lesson. I think he I think he was partly right, and it it may have been a, partly a product that he was a somewhat depressed man himself all his life. And, and uh, but it, it but we all we all especially those of us who who adored him would all practice mourning. And, and you, in some of the services, you couldn't go off them. You couldn't go to the bathroom without having some kind of terminal discussion with someone. And God forbid if you should go on vacation, it was like a wake. And 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 it, it, it see. And, uh, and at first, I thought it was uh, terribly artificial, and everybody was sort of doing it, you know, the way conventionally. And, and then I thought, well, that's not fair because what's happening is people are learning about this and they're practicing it. And I remembered what it's like when the children first get a ball and they go all over the house driving everybody crazy bouncing it and, and that's what we were all doing we were bouncing the morning ball off each other right and left and I think we probably learned something about the you know how you do it remembering bearing etc acknowledging all these principles and, and but I think when that happens and when it happens naturally uh, when you've anticipated someone going it uh, it, it just occurs. But of course, an awful lot of therapies don't end that way. I mean, someone has to go to Seattle. People are always going to Seattle. And they, and, and, and you, and, or they run out of money, or they've, uh, something has happened that simply imposes itself as, a, as an event. And then you want to end. But you want to take some time to end, and that that becomes a time when you talk. When you, I think that's one of the one of the places where termination as a concept enters very sensibly. I don't want you to go too quick. I want to. Can we? Can't we say goodbye? In some fashion, how do you say goodbye to each other? And and you then learn that there are some people that don't say goodbye. They just get out, right? And then you say, well, maybe it's good to, or maybe we'll. We'll do something with that, and, and then we discover often, very dramatically, as do the patients sometimes, very dramatically, that this moment of parting is the most important moment in the whole treatment. It's the moment when people can either explicitly say or convey that they love each other. And up to now, you know, everybody's been so shy. And oh my God, if I if I said I love the patient that. Tom Gutal would show up with a legal core and, and we'd all be taken off to jail and you know and it's just one step away from bedding down you know the whole thing and, and, and this nonsense which is you know which is legally sensible he's going to come and talk to us this week months I'm preparing my introduction to his remark and, uh, and um, anyway but, but that um, but that whether whether the legal thing gets into our heads at that moment or not. The fact is that that, that moment of parting is a is one of uh, it gives us an opportunity that isn't just an opportunity that's that has an inevitability about it that uh, that brings with a, a feelings that uh, that make that may make the whole thing worthwhile. I never knew what you felt the patient until you said goodbye. The children sometimes say that. I never knew what you felt. And was that because, you know, we're always accusing them of saying the most important thing on the way out the door. You know, that's a, that's a classic, right? But we're the same way, you know. We may say the most important thing only on their way out of the door. <laughs> well, that's all right. At least we got to say it. And that, uh, that as a part of termination seems to me uh, priceless. There was an instance that I had in one supervisory experience with a group of people not long ago where where the uh, where the where a young therapist was obviously I thought very good to tell us something but very conflicted and, and uh, I don't know what in fact she told the patient but what she told what she told us she told the patient I thought she was shrewd enough not to have given us the whole story but what she did tell us she told the patient was that I'm astonished she said to the patient I'm astonished by what you have done and, and we were all astonished that she had said it. But she had done it in such a way that we knew it, it, it felt right. It felt real, it felt right. And then, as if she had set us up to get our gooses cooked, she waited until the next time we all kept together. And she said to us, you know, you know what the patient said to me this last time? 
you have astonished me. They both astonished each other. And it was, it was true. They, it, you could understand. I mean, I don't say it's true. It seemed true to me because the patient was someone who had always wanted to be like the therapist. To look like the therapist, to dress like the therapist, have a career like the therapist, be independent like the therapist. And to, to find that that person now could be paying attention to miserable me, you know, that was astonishing. And on the other hand, the therapist who was new to this work was astonished right, that she could be useful to this person. Right? So they each, they each joined their different astonishments and they could say it to each other. And, and I'm, I'm naive enough to think that saying it was, and here, here, here the words were valuable, saying it was a kind of singing, a kind of song that, 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 that it certainly had in our minds quite an un, almost unforgettable element about it. But that is a form of termination I am uh, certainly enthusiastic about. But then that's two, then. Those who fall off the tree because they're done, and, uh, and those that, and those that, uh, are not done because they have to move to Seattle and we have to do something about that to make sure that the thing has at least a push into the future something memorable to retain itself so that's really a, so this termination not so much a termination as a continuance when it's like that I think that I think part of the religion of termination arose not only out of the mourning thing which is a good reason I think we want to we want to be able to lose each other and, and keep each other, which is what mourning does, doesn't it? I mean, in a sense, we wash each other out of our hair, but we also have the memory of the good stuff, which has re which can remain. But th there was another meaning of termination, I think, which is difficult for me at least, <clears throat> and that was the the scientific meaning. That is that that this is the end of the operation. And Freud loved the surgical analogy. And you've got to you've got to wrap it up. You've got to sew them up. You've got to turn off the anesthetic at the right moment. And uh, you've got to do it. You've got to do it right. There's a set of procedures that you should you should carry out, or else the operation isn't finished. The operation isn't successful, as we say. Right? And uh, and there's probably something to that. Although um, the cases that are best adapted for psychoanalysis, in my experience, don't require that. They, they sew themselves up and go on. So that, that that surgical thing falls apart there. But there may be instances where there is a kind of, of, uh, of finishing the operation, completing the operation, completing the experiment, another analogy Freud liked to use, where that may be. But I, I find myself hard-pressed to recall experiences which seemed that way to me. Certainly it wasn't the case in my own analytic work, but that may be the, a problem. Well, the, um, you know, I'm sure many of you know the work of James Mann, who was a student of Elvin Simrad. And, and you remember one of the, th one of the things he did was to adapt short-term work to the mourning process. That is, by setting a termination date, he could precipitate the mourning process. That was the, that was the ideological background of, of his work. And he has described a great many experiences where that's useful, where, where there's a kind of enforced, enforced withdrawal. And the person then brings up different things uh, that, are, that are useful for them to work through. This is the language of that kind of thing. Um, and I don't, I don't question that there's value to that in some sense. But uh, my prejudice, and, and, uh, and it's only a prejudice, is that that way of thinking about the field as a whole, or even a large segment of it, is flawed, and and that one can see it as a as a possible structure, but. And, and one of my reasons for saying it's flawed is that if you look at, again, the outcome study, and you put people that do that kind of therapy against people that do this kind of therapy against that, there isn't much difference. So I think that the factors they have in common, once again, are the most important one. And, and, and then, and then I, would I would fault that model of termination on another basis. I really think it's an attempt to impose a psychological structure on events. And I think that's a mistake. 
because that supposes that there is a psychological structure we know that's applicable. That you can get the support for it in that paragraph following the last one I quoted from Freud. But I'm, I'm very suspicious. And, and I'm frankly, much as I respect some of the short-term workers in our community, we have some very talented ones. We had a very talented one here just a short time ago, Lee McCulloch, the Beth Beth Israel. I'm skeptical about that kind of procedural business in the psychologically human. And the, my prediction is that those things will eventually, you know, there'll always be new ones, just like there'll always be new drugs. And they're, always, and they're always worth experimenting with in the hope of finding something. But I, suspect, I think there's a, I think they're overlooking, as I say, what I've called these, the common factors. Well, the final thing I wanted to say was, and I've talked too long, but the final thing that I wanted to say was that, um, in all these discussions, the question that that bothers me the most, that that, that keeps coming back to haunt me, and it interrupts me even now, as I think is that how do we how do we make how can how are ideas made useful humanly you know i'm talking about leaning rather than talking so yeah i'm skeptical about ideas and the human um, and i'm not alone in that i mean the whole concept of intellectualization is really an attack on the usefulness of ideas and psychological ideas as defenses and cliches and the rest of it but how do we how do we, how do we make our ideas useful humanly? Um, now, it, it's, it's easy to answer that you know, on a certain point. I mean, there are lots of ideas that we, you know, what else have you got except ideas, um, and uh, in one form or another, and, and we have the idea of diseases and symptoms, and then that leads to the concept of specific treatments or drugs, medications or whatever, and that's an, that's a, it's an invaluable idea. We, we, we wouldn't want to be without that. Is it a human thing? Oh, yes. I don't see why you should not think so. I've said myself that when one has this idea of sickness, when the idea comes into our head of sickness or wrongness, there's a certain point in the treatment when that's a, that's a red light that says, uh, that says, careful. You know, turn on the green light. And go ahead and see if you can't see if you can't disabuse yourself of that. See if you can't get past the difficulties of of, uh, of grasping the other person's perspective. And that 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 that's that seems to me a useful idea. Um, and then then I've often talked about how the problem of despair when one's leaning into something. You know, and you and you just can't you can't feel like doing it anymore, you know. You just, I mean, is it worth it? Am I right to do this? And, I, and it's it's just, I'm the one that has the despair now. And, and that, that is often a good moment to give medication. Usually we give them to the patients rather than taking them ourselves. And it's not clear that that's always the best thing to do, but it's, for some reason or other, it seems to be more, it seems to be the way to do it. Maybe because the patient is the one who's giving us the despair, and if we take it and then go see the next patient, and we've had the medication, the medication will be too much. We we'll get hypomanic with the next patient. So that there's a certain logic in giving it to the to what may be part of the source of our despair. But aren't all our ideas? Aren't all of them useful? I mean, you know, I mean, today the idea of projective identification I hear everywhere. And apparently, if you if if you're if a supervisor or an examiner on the American boards wants to ask a question, that's the one that now I'm told is comes most comes most often to their minds. So you have to have several answers depending upon the kind of questioner. You have to have several answers to that question: what is projective identification? And it, and it's you know it's a it's a good idea projective identification. It's nice. It's it it is it pulls a little change on the notion of projection itself. Brings, it brings the projector and the projectee, or whatever it is, a little closer together in a useful, a very useful way. You wouldn't want to be without it. Well, <clears throat> thank you for listening, or if, you, if you were listening, <laughs> well, patiently, and for putting up with me over this long haul. I think that's as much as I have to say.